Following the London Naval Treaty, the Marine Nationale was in an interesting position. Because of the hardships of World War I and the post-war environment, not exactly being conducive to ship construction, but even before the First World War, France had lost its status as a first-rate naval power, and because of these conditions in the early 1930s, it was even more evident as they already relegated their rather interesting pre-dreadnoughts to training ships, and with their surviving dreadnoughts of the Corbet and Britannia classes getting rather old and experiencing troubles due to their age. With all these factors in mind, coming out of the London Naval Treaty, it was clear that capital ship construction could not be held off any longer, because even if they were able to get the ships laid down in 1931, the earliest that they could be ready for service would be 1935, and with the clouds of war getting darker over Europe, they felt they needed to act. Before we continue, I should note that the history of the Dunkirk class goes back even further into the 1920s, but I decided following the London Naval Treaty is a good place to pick it up. Anyway, the French General Naval Staff, in the wake of the London Naval Treaty, initially proposed several design tonnages for the new capital ships, with a minimum displacement of 23,333 tons and a max tonnage of 25,000 tons, and thought that they could have three of these ships. Now, following continued design discussions, other proposals with 17,500 tons and others with 35,000 ton displacements, with the latter being feasible only if France upgraded its naval building infrastructure. All these proposals came with the German Navy in mind, as in the previous year in 1929, they laid down the first Panzerschiff of the Deutschland class. Now, as I talked about in more detail in my pocket battleship video, with the Germans creating a heavily armed and relatively fast ship at 26 knots with 11 inch or 280 millimeter guns, which caused quite a stir for the French naval designers, because they wanted their new ships to be able to have the armor and armament to fight these new German commerce raiders, eventually coming up with the design parameters as followed. A standard displacement of 25,000 tons, a main armament of 13-inch or 330mm guns, and two quadruple turrets forward. A secondary battery of 5.1-inch or 130mm guns, protection sufficient enough to resist a 280mm shell, or a 500 kilogram bomb released at 3,000 meters, and underwater protection sufficient to resist a 300 kilogram charge. With the tonnage increasing to 26,500 to accommodate the increase in gun size. With these specifications, the Marine Nationale thought they would be able to handle the German Panzerschiff threat in the Atlantic, and should the situation arise, they could assist the older quote unquote heavy ships of the Britannia class against the Regiona Marina. The order for the Strasbourg would be placed in July of 1934. Now, it's important to note that the designs for Strasbourg and Dunkirk were influenced by that of HMS Nelson and Rodney of the Royal Navy. With all the main armament being forward and trainable secondaries aft, as well as a heavy armor deck over the magazines and machinery, and a somewhat short length for the armored citadel, all being characteristics of recent British capital ship design. Now, there are some differences, notably in machinery and aircraft facilities on board the Dunkirk class. Moving on to Strasbourg's overall characteristics, she would differ from her sister ship, being slightly heavier at 27,300 tons standard displacement and 36,380 tons full load. She would have six Indret small water tube boilers with superheating that would power four shafts, producing around 107,000 shaft horsepower, giving the ship a top speed of 29.5 knots. The main armament would be eight 13 inch or 330 millimeter 52 caliber guns and two quadruple turrets forward, along with 16 5.1 inch or 130 millimeter 45 caliber guns and three quadruple turrets and two twin mountings. Her light anti aircraft battery would consist of eight 37 millimeter 50 caliber anti aircraft guns, along with 32 13.2 millimeter anti aircraft guns and eight quad mounts. She would have an armor belt of 283 millimeters or 11.1 inches thick, as well as a deck of 125 millimeters or 4.9 inches thick. Her turrets would have a thickness varying from 160 to 360 millimeters or 6.3 inches to 14.1 inches. She would be laid down in November of 1934, launched in December of 1936, and commissioned in the Marine Nationale in September of 1938. Following commissioning, Strasbourg would head for dock to inspect her machinery and would resume sea trials on the 15th of December, where gunnery trials and a workup were to ensure that the ship would be ready for service quickly, as the international situation in Europe was worsening. Then on the 24th of April, 1939, along with the Dunkirk, together the ships would now form the 1st Battle Division. They would go to Lisbon, Portugal on a goodwill visit, and then return to the port of Brest to entertain a British squadron that was visiting on the 7th of May, 1939. The future Forster raid would do exercises off the British coast until late June, and then during July and August, they would do even more exercises off the coast of Brittany this time. 
By September the 3rd, the war was declared, and with discussions with the British, the French had taken primary responsibility for protecting the Allied trade routes from the Gulf of Guinea to the Channel, including the waters off North African coast and the Portuguese coast, and to the Bay of Biscay. But more importantly, the French would have the force to raid, which would compose of a force based out of Brest, being made up of the two fast battleships, three modern light cruisers, and eight of the most modern destroyers, that were to hunt enemy surface raiders in the area east of the line running from Usant through the Azores to the Cape Verde Islands. After assisting in bringing in the ocean layer Flandre back to France from the Azores, the force de raid was back in Brest. Now, Strasbourg and about half the force de raid would be transitioned into a group called Force X, along with the ships from the Mediterranean fleet, and the British carrier Hermes to be based out of Dakar, where the new Force X would arrive on the 14th of October, where they would search the area for German raiders and merchant ships, doing this until November 21st, where Strasbourg and Algier would head back to mainland France, arriving in the port of Brest on November the 29th. Now, in the early months of 1940, it was feared that the Italians would enter the war on the side of the Germans. So, the newly reunited Force de Raid would head to the Mediterranean and be based out of Mers el Kabir in Algeria, arriving on April the 2nd, but this was only a brief stay, as the British wanted a joint operation to block German iron ore imports from Norway. So, Strasbourg and the Force de Raid would head back to Brest, and then escort troop convoys to Norway between the 9th and 12th of April. But, as the situation in the Mediterranean started to heat up, they were sent back to Mers el Kabir, arriving by the 27th of April. They would spend May doing exercises, and then by June the 10th, the Italians entered the war. With the bulk of the French fleet on the North African coast, training to get ready to face the Regia Marina, on the 12th, they received information which suggested the Kriegsmarine intended to force itself through the Strait of Gibraltar with a force of battleships to reinforce the Italian fleet, in which the French sortied and assembled south of Cartagena in Spain. After essentially chasing themselves around the Mediterranean due to false information, they returned to Mers el Kabir. This would be the last sortie for Strasbourg in the war. What came next would be known as Operation Catapult. As I have previously covered this subject on my videos on HMS Hood and Dunkirk, it's still an interesting topic, so I'll try my best to cover it here. After the French surrender was signed on June 22nd, the British were concerned about the security of the French fleet particularly due to Article 8 of the Armistice, because it stipulated that the French fleet should be brought back to France. Now, Admiral of the Fleet Darlan would continue to repeat his assurances that the French fleet would not be handed over to the Germans, but this trust was diminished when he joined the new Philippe Pétain regime. Now, the problem for the British was that the situation was misread quite literally, because the Armistice was mistranslated, causing issues to arise in seeing how the French fleet would be decommissioned by the German and Italian supervisors. Prime Minister Winston Churchill became obsessed with the idea that once the fleet was back in mainland France, the Germans would seize the ships by force, which would threaten the domination of the European theater by the Royal Navy. Now, there really isn't any evidence suggesting that Hitler was interested in the French fleet, besides preventing it from having it fall into the hands of the British. Nevertheless, the British sent Force H to Mers el Kabir, where they sent an ultimatum on July 3rd to the French fleet. Negotiations would prove to be difficult, as French Admiral Jean Soul initially refused to engage in talks for fear of violating the terms of the armistice, and then he demanded that any negotiations that he would be involved in would be conducted with an officer of equal rank. James Somerville, who was tied to his flagship so that the operation could be executed properly, sent Captain Holland, who was charged with negotiations, doing so eventually with Jean Soul's flag captain. After being presented with Somerville's ultimatum, Jen Sewell ordered that his fleet be prepared to break out and fight. Jen Sewell tried to contact Darlan, but could not reach him, and the only advice he did receive was from his deputy, which was to meet force with force, and Somerville was also poorly supported by the Admiralty. Then at 5.25pm, the French ships went into action stations, and at 5.55, HMS Hood fired the first salvo. Strasbourg was quickly away from dock in Mers el Kabir, and began her escape from the port, being chased by Hood and aircraft from HMS Arc Royal heading first to south of Sardinia and then onto the French port of Toulon. Now, the next notable event Strasbourg would be involved in would be joining a French force in the Mediterranean that did not do a whole lot due to the restrictions placed on them by the Germans. Now, Strasbourg would be scuttled in Toulon following the Allied invasion of North Africa, where the Germans were coming with the intention to seize the fleet. She would have scuttling charges blown in the morning of November the 8th. She would finally be sold for scrap in March of 1955, finally ending the ship's story. I definitely think Strasbourg and her sister ship Dunkirk have an interesting history and design. I've always had a soft spot for French capital ships, as they seem to have very good aesthetics and a somewhat unique layout when it comes to their guns. 
Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Please remember to like and subscribe.